Hello everyone, my name is Sylvain Lézé from the Department of Aeronautics at Imperial College London and this is a new episode of the podcast uh, Turbulence at the Exascape. Uh, if you're not familiar with the podcast, uh, we are trying to gather the view of the scientific community regarding um, uh, the transition to exascale uh, computing for the turbulence community, but not only, we are also uh, trying to uh, gather uh, different views about uh, computational free dynamics to study turbulent flows and about the numerics and, uh, and so on and so on. So uh, this podcast is part of the uh, UK uh, initiative called uh, Excalibur, which is a, a big five-year project uh, towards exascale computing, aiming at uh, redesigning and rethinking uh, uh, the software landscape in the UK, um, not just for turbulent flow, but for uh, everything in, in uh, science that could benefit from high performance computing. So uh, today we have an international guest, uh, Pedro Costa, who is currently uh, working at the University of Iceland in uh, Reykjavik. And uh, Pedro did his uh, PhD uh, in Delft, did also spend some time in uh, Sweden at KTH. So he has uh, a lot of uh, international um, experience and expertise. Uh, his uh, domain of research are related to computational free dynamic uh, software development uh, to study turbulent flows, and in particular, wall bonded flows with or without particles. So it's a great pleasure to uh, to have uh, you, Pedro. So good uh, good morning, Pedro. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Good morning. Um, so I'm going to start with my question. And um, for those who don't know you or who don't know you very well, uh, please, can you tell us a little bit ab about yourself, where you are from, what you have studied, and how did you end up um, at the University of Iceland in Reykjavik? Yeah, sure. So. Yeah, my progress has been always going slowly north and more north and more north. So I started in Portugal. I'm Portuguese from suburbs of Lisbon, where I lived uh, until I was 23 years old. I did my uh, bachelor and my master's at uh, in Lisbon at the Technical University of Lisbon uh, at a faculty called Instituto Superior Técnico. Uh, I did pretty much all there, except for six months uh, Erasmus exchange that I did uh, in Delft. Um, and because I like so much that exchange, I uh, work hard to get a PhD position in Delft and I succeeded. So I went to Delft in 2013 to pursue a PhD uh, on uh, dense turbulent suspension transport, studied using numerical simulations in the laboratory of uh, Aero and hydrodynamics, that's in the uh, Department of Mechanical Engineering, uh, headed by uh, Jerry Vesterwill. Um, uh, and then, yeah, so I did my PhD there and I moved further north into Stockholm for a postdoc in the group of Luca Brandt uh, of two years. And then, for family reasons, I decided to move even further north. So I applied for a postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Iceland. And uh, yeah, here I am uh, in Reykjavik. So this is my, my trip. Excellent. Um, I wanted to ask you, uh, how did you become interested in high performance computing and turbulent flows and CFD? Yeah, it's, it's quite interesting. So um, I was, since early in my bachelor's, I got uh, interested in, in fluid dynamics. And I think it was somehow triggered by the fact that fluids are something that seems quite trivial that we, we see every day. But when we start studying it, we and we start really appreciating it, we we it turns out that it's actually very complex, intricate phenomena that seems like very mundane and uh, like, for instance, smoke as, uh, coming out of a cigarette. So when I went for my Erasmus in Delft during my master's, I already chose most of the fluid dynamics related uh, courses that I couldn't have, that were not provided at the University of Lisbon. So I don't know what triggered exactly that interest, interest in fluid mechanics, it was probably something like this. Uh, but I knew that I, when I went to Delft, uh, looking back now from the choice of my courses, I was already quite into it. And my interest in turbulence in partic particular was triggered uh, when I took the turbulence course of who then came to be my PhD supervisor of uh, uh, Wim Paul Braham, which was a very well-oiled uh, turbulence course uh, that has been taught by many of the PIs of the lab where I did my PhD, that I think at least since Franz Neustadt uh, was uh, giving it. 
And I realized that turbulence is a very complicated phenomenon that uh, is really chaotic, uh, three-dimensional, unsteady. Uh, sometimes with pen and paper, we can make some very nice predictions of the important quantities. Uh, however, other times we need really to resort to massively parallel simulations uh, to really understand them. So this, so this, this sort of, uh, yeah, the, the, this, this course that Finpol taught and this, this, these aspects of, of turbulence was what really got me uh, interested in this, on the subject. Yeah, then you asked about the interest in HPC. That came a bit later when I uh, actually had to start working on my PhD and I got from Wim Paul, my PhD supervisor, a relatively complex code that, uh, complex not in the sense that was poorly written, but in the sense that it had quite some advanced mm -hmm. MPI because it was a code for simulating particle-laden turbulent flows. And uh, yeah, I, I started, I, so I was forced to learn MPI and I remember that I, well, there was this week and I took a, a, a three-day course from the Edinburgh Parallel Computing Center. And I, I just, uh, yeah, I just sort of really enjoyed uh, learning MPI, uh, just the different paradigm of thinking in distributed memory terms. And uh, yeah, it, it felt a bit like a game initially. If I would do things wrong, I would get a deadlock. So why should I solve this? And somehow I got really, uh, yeah, I really started to like MPI and then realizing the power of it to really allow us to really give us the ammunition to, to solve really complex turbulent flows. Uh, yeah, so that was what really, really triggered the, my interest in, in, in HPC. Great. It was more of a learning on the job kind of thing. Thank you. And uh, <clears throat> so you said you, you, you've been uh, studying in, in, in Portugal, in Netherlands, and now in, in Reykjavik. And I'd like to ask you, what, because, well, obviously it's uh, not necessarily a, a well-known uh, place. Yeah. Uh, what's the best thing about working at the University of Iceland in, in Reykjavik? What do you like about it? Yeah, it's, it's quite a, a, a good question because... So Iceland is is a, a, an island in the in in you know in almost at the Arctic Circle in the in the in the north of the Atlantic, and uh, it, despite the big so there's a huge amount of land so maybe two point times uh, the size of the Netherlands, but while Netherlands has 17 million people, Iceland has a population of 350 thousand people. So it feels in some sense a bit like a village. So when I came here, because uh, I came for personal reasons, for family reasons, I thought that I could be compromising somehow uh, my, 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 my professional, you know, my, my progress. But actually uh, I, I was mistaken because first of all, this, this grant that, that uh, I got gives me really uh, a lot of freedom to do what I think is best and to pursue ideas that sometimes are a bit risky. And if I was in a project that had more restricted goals, I, was not be, I would not be able to. And second, because it's a smaller country, if someone seeks an expert in high performance computing, computational fluid dynamics, uh, turbulence, people, typically people will come to me. So there's a lot of nice opportunities that uh, came from the fact that there's not so many uh, 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 experts. Then I had some concerns about, for instance, the lack of computing resources, but the European uh, sort of um, ecosystem for my high performance computing and resource allocation, it works so well via praise or uh, this HPC Europa tree mm -hmm. projects that, uh, yeah, I didn't also felt the lack of computing time to do my work. So it has been, a, a a really good experience. Good. Yeah. Thank you very much. So uh, a brief question without going in too much detail, but um, what projects are you working on at the moment? So I, could, I, I sort of carried on because I, here I, I, I get the freedom to, to work on different projects. Mm -hmm. I try to carry on a bit the previous collaborations that I had on uh, simulations of uh, particle laden flows, uh, typically simulated not with uh, so-called point particle approximations, but really resolving the flow around many small mm -hmm. uh, particles using a, a, an immersed boundary method, which you, you and many people in the audience hopefully are familiar with. Uh, 
And also when I did my postdoc in the group of Luca Brandt, I got uh, access and, and, and I learned a huge portfolio of other numerical methods that can be employed to study uh, bubbly flow, drop-on laden flows. And with all that ammunition coming here, I kept some of these previous collaborations, but I also started a few ones because for instance, in the, in the geothermal sector, uh, gas liquid flow through geothermal wells is, uh, is uh, you know, a flow with re very rich physics, uh, heat transfer, phase change, uh, and of course, turbulent, wall ball and multi-phase turbulence. And this is something that uh, we already have most of the tools to tackle this with almost first principle simulations. So I also try to here to, to work on, on this type of uh, application. Great, uh, thank you. So let's go into uh, more specific. You mentioned some work about uh, particle laden flows in wall bonded turbulent flow. So can you tell us a little bit more about that? And in particular, I'm curious, uh, to see how you are doing your simulation on supercomputers. I'm, I mean, it's well known that when you have particles, you might have some um, load balancing issues. So uh, if you can tell us a little bit more about this, um, this work. Sure, absolutely. So uh, I worked on this uh, topic since my PhD, first in uh, turbulent particle suspensions, and then more recently uh, in collaboration with Luca Brandt from KTH and Francesco Pitano from Padova University, we revisit an old problem or a problem that has been uh, addressed since maybe the early 90s, uh, in which small inertial particles in all bundle turbulence are simulated using so called point particle mm -hmm. uh, methods. So this is this, the approach that you know, is used to simulate. Uh, uh, particle in the with point particles is you know, scientifically sound. Uh, but has never been really put to test against really resolved data. So our contribution here was to do the very first simulations, interface resolved simulations of small inertial particles from first principles using an immersed boundary method. And indeed, as you say, the simulations are computationally really challenging. Load balancing is, is definitely, definitely an issue. And it occurs in a few, uh, in a few instances. The nice thing, so one, one thing that should be done if you have uh, you know uh, a, a flow with with uh, with particles or with some dispersed phase, and because we use an immersed boundary method, we have a grid that conforms to the surface of each particle, and that grid has to communicate with the grid of the fluid. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, operations that are not stencil like, but in some sense the handling, the parallelization handling can be done similar to the stencil-like operations. So they can be a bit intensive. What, what is important to do in terms of fluid balancing would be that the region in which the distribution of these particles, along which the distribution of these particles is inhomogeneous, the domain is not de decomposed in that region. Mm -hmm. So if I have a turbulent channel, typically the particles migrate from the core of the channel where, where the turbulence is high towards the wall. So if we decompose, for instance, with so-called uh, pencils, so if we divide domain, the domain into small pencils that are aligned along the direction perpendicular to the wall, this uh, you know, doesn't, uh, you know, samples the entire inhomogeneity of the particle distribution and takes care of this, uh, load balancing issue if you have enough particles, which is the case here. Uh, then there's another, there's some other aspect that is maybe more technical that is related to the IBM forcing. Uh, so we had to do the IBM forcing in a Eulerian framework. And this made it independent of the, of the number of particles and helped a bit load uh, balancing, but it would be a bit tricky to explain it in, in, in few, uh, Minutes. Good. And which uh, flow solver are you using for those simulation? So this flow solver is actually uh, a sort of a predecessor of, of, of an open source uh, solver called CANS that I developed between my PhD and my postdoc. It's a, a solver called Interparts, uh, uh, which I developed during my, my PhD. So I was very fortunate that I started my PhD in uh, early 2013, mm -hmm. just when the 2D comp library was ready to, that you, you and uh, Ning Li uh, 
developed was ready to be used. So I leveraged that library and I uh, leveraged also a very fast uh, direct solver for the Poisson equation, for the second order finite difference Poisson equation. And so this was the, the code that was used. So it's a you know, plain vanilla standard finite difference, uh, 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 second order finite difference pressure uh, correction method extended then with an immersed boundary method for particle latent flows and with some tricks because of course when particles get very close together you need to handle short range hydrodynamic interactions between particles and ultimately also collisions between particles and what's the difference so now you're you're uh, i mean uh, cans i mean i've seen some publications about cans so what's the difference between the, this code and cans so they're quite uh, different there are quite some similarities, but Kans was written from scratch. So I always wanted to write, uh, so this code was specifically for turbulent channel flow. Okay. And I always wanted to write a general purpose, a more general purpose Poisson solver that leverages this, you know, very efficient direct methods which exploit fast Fourier transforms. And I realized that in the literature, there were many uh, uh, researchers that uh, for that we're doing massive simulations uh, using uh, iterative codes to so, or iterative methods to solve the Poisson equation for combinations of boundary conditions that could actually be uh, solved using this type of direct method that could be sometimes almost an order of magnitude faster. So between my PhD and my postdoc, so I, I had some break in Portugal, maybe I got a bit bored, bored and I finally found the time to rewrite from scratch this, this, this Poisson solver, which was meant initially to be a sort of maybe modern alternative of this, uh, you know, fish pack, uh, old fish pack routines. And maybe a fun fact for the audience is fish pack, apparently is called fish pack, pack because fish in English Fish in uh, in French is poisson. Mm -hmm. um, ah, I see what you mean. Okay, <laughs> excellent. So, um, yeah, so it's it, that was the initial motivation, but then I just got carried away and then I wrote from scratch a, a general purpose poisson solver. Uh, yeah, so in in the in this interparts code, if I wanted to change the boundary conditions, uh, I would, it would maybe take me uh, one day because I had to rewrite a lot of parts of, many parts of the code. And in CANS, I sort of implemented this in a very unified and elegant way, somehow, maybe I'm sounding a bit cocky <laughs> now, but um, uh, without really compromising the, the performance. And, and yeah, so this is now, you, now typically I use this code as sort of the engine for uh, 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 multi-phase flow codes. Also for two fluid flows, uh, typically you, so when I went to the group of Luca Brandt, we had a lot of projects regarding two fluid flows like droplet or bubbly laden flows or emulsions. And the type of Poisson equation that one has to solve there is slightly different, but it turns out that with some small tricks, you can mm -hmm. still leverage this type of direct solvers. So Kanz ended up being sort of the engine of uh, several multi-phase flow applications. So it was kind of... Uh, was really just, just It's written in Fortran or in C or... Oh yeah, so it's written in, in mod, what... Uh, what uh, modern Fortran. Now, modern Fortran. Okay. So it has features from the different standards, even from the standard of 2018. And it has a, a it's not a big code. I try to keep it relatively uh, simple and self-contained uh, on purpose, because then it's, it's easier for me to maintain and for people to use. So sometimes maybe people want some feature that is not there. But I, I prefer to keep it self-contained because okay. I'm the only one, uh, simple and self-contained because I'm the only one maintaining it. So yeah, not, not very big, around 10 lines of code. And it has an MPI, uh, standard MPI decom uh, decomposition, leverages the 2D comp library. Mm -hmm. And actually quite recently, uh, or in 2018, 18, I, I was very fortunate to get in touch with very clever people from NVIDIA, like Massimiliano Fatica, Joshua Romero, and Everett Phillips. 
and they helped us all supporting the code to uh, run on many GPUs. And uh, I think the code has run on thousands of, 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 of it has run at least up to 2000 uh, GPUs on, on P stained. And yeah, and by helping, I mean, they did it. <laughs> yeah. I just did the final polishing, but they did an amazing job. Uh, so. Excellent. Yeah. Good. Well, we are, uh, I'm in discussion with NVIDIA to develop uh, a GPU friendly version of 2 dd Component 50. So yeah, it might happen in the uh, next uh, few years. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I, actually, I'm also in, in touch with this uh, with uh, with uh, this team working on a project that maybe I'm not sure if it's the same, but it's certainly similar, in which a library similar to the, to the comp is being developed uh, with different backends. Yes. So typically, you have uh, for for uh, multi GPU communication not only MPI. You you can have different implementations of MPI for to to calculate this transpose of the arrays to compute the Fourier transforms, for instance. You can have uh, MPL to all, but also a simple point to point, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, MPI type of communication. But also you can, you have different libraries, also have the Nico library and NVish, MEM and, and others. And what this library is, uh, does is that it does, so for each system, it computes not only, it has this auto-tuning step in which it computes not only the best configuration of the pencils, but also the best communication backend, because that varies between systems. And that is really nice for someone that, uh, you know, is developing numerical methods, because I don't want to, I, I, I want to tell the code what to do. Yeah, yeah. Of and course. the library to figure out how to do it. So... Yeah, I think this type of of, of uh, libraries, together with advances in the in the in the in the compilers and etc., uh, will really you know help the CFD community to focus on the study of turbulence and on the implementation of numerical methods. Excellent. I have one final question about uh, flow solvers. I, I've seen you uh, on archive um, a project called Snack. Exactly. But, oh, I um, forgot to so mention I Snack. So adding Snack some is, some, uh, some uh, multi-block capabilities. Exactly, indeed. So Snack is, can spell backwards. I, I couldn't figure out a better name for it. <laughs> <laughs> and it's okay. indeed a multi-block code. So what I, what I figured is that, so I always wanted to, 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 to have some uh, finite difference multi-block code because there are several applications, uh, especially at low Reynolds number, but also, uh, you know, finite and considerably mm -hmm. high uh, in which you want to solve the multi-phase flow in a complex geometry like particles flowing in a t-junction or in an l channel and what i realized is that most of these interesting geometries that uh, can be tackled with the multi-block code always have sort of a direction that is extruded that's homogeneous that's, that mm -hmm. doesn't change like an l will have a, a, you know, a spanwise direction that is sort of, can have a typically uniform grid. So I, I figured that I could, in that direction, use FFTs or cosine transforms or cosine transforms to sort of uh, simplify the yeah. Poisson equation that has to be solved, and then solve along planes with, a, with an iterative method, uh, the, the remainder of the, of the Poisson equation for mass conservation. So it's a code that exploits also FFTs in a multi-block setting to really accelerate the solution of the Poisson equation. And I'm quite happy uh, with the performance that I achieved. I hope that you know, at a later stage I can port it to, to GPUs, but we are ready in collaboration with KTH, we already implemented, you know, uh, uh, IBM for particle agent flows, and we have been doing, uh, you know, L channel with particles, and it seems to work quite well. So yeah, thanks for mentioning it. I, 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 I you know, I'm, I'm, I'm very curious and interesting because uh, I've always been looking at uh, how to put a multi-block uh, strategy in my flow solver. Yeah. Uh, but it's, it's a bit more complicated than I thought with high order schemes and stuff. But anyway, yeah, that's... I, 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 I can see that it's quite complicated. This is why I leverage a, you know, a, a multi grid solver because and and I don't decompose the direction where I do the FFTs. Otherwise, yeah. it would be a nightmare to 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 implement. 
Great. Thank you. Um, I, I can see that uh, time is, is flying by. So I, I have a few questions about um, exascale uh, um, computing. And my first question is, um, if I give you access to, uh, to an exascale computer uh, tomorrow, what, what would you do with it that obviously you cannot do at the moment? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, if you give me an exascale computer tomorrow, <laughs> what would I do with it? Uh, the answer is, I don't know. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it's an interesting question. What is the problem that is worthy of exascale? Would it, is it like a, a single phase flow at relatively high Reynolds number, where you have already a number of DNS codes that are maybe ready to tackle it, or mo a more complex multi-physics flow? So this is a question I, I really don't have uh, an answer to. But what really excites me about exascale, more than having access to an exascale machine, is also being in a relatively small country with not a lot of computational resources, the easier and cheaper access to petascale machines. So that's sort of a side product of, of exascale. And I, I think this allows for many interesting things, especially uncertainty quantification, which we, we know. We have these very expensive direct numerical simulations, for instance, this, uh, this ones of particle latent flows that I mentioned, and it's for one specific set of parameters. And it's super expensive to do you know, parameter studies uh, uh, in here. So I think you know, the easier, ever increasing uh, access to, 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 to petascale machines uh, will enable, you know, uh, these important uh, uncertain quantification studies that should be performed to really, you know, assess the sensitivity of our results to small changes in the, in the parameters. Excellent. And um, I mean, you have been developing uh, flow solvers for quite some time now, and you have experience in CPUs, GPUs, and I was wondering if, if uh, are you happy with the hardware that are currently available to, to the community or if there's anything you, you would like to see or you would like to um, change uh, I, regarding the hardware? Yeah. Regarding the hardware, to be honest, I'm not really an, an expert in, in, in hardware. What, uh, I, what I would really like is that we, as people that develop numerical methods for uh, simulations of, 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 of uh, fluid flows, and, and, and also actually study them, uh, that we can have implementations that are sort of agnostic of the hardware. And then a compiler or a library will take care of making sure that whatever we write is deployed as efficient as possible. And I think the, the en entire ecosystem is working really hard to achieve this, starting from the Fortran standard, in which there's some, still some minor things that have to, uh, can be improved and are going to be improved related to the native parallel uh, features of Fortran, like the do concurrent loops that still do not support reductions in the standard. Um, and, you know, this type of libraries that, you know, will determine what is the best backend, best communication backend, depending on the hardware where you are. And uh, yeah, so I hope that in future, we will converge towards implementations that are less, more and more agnostic of the hardware and the compiler and libraries will, you know, make sure that we are using it as efficiently as possible. And then have you, so in the, in CANS or uh, SNAC, have, is there any um, uh, limitation? I mean, do you have any issues with memories or is it uh, CPU bounds or is, is there, what what's the bottleneck if there is one um, for those for those code? What would you say is the bottleneck? Yeah, at some point when we strong scale the bottleneck, is, it's going to be a memory bound uh, problem. So, uh, but typically, uh, at least for the type of systems that uh, that I I, tr I I try to simulate, I never reach the problem mm -hmm. an art limit in which I say, okay, this cannot be simulated with okay. enough uh, computing uh, time. Uh, also, also because this, this type of direct solvers that are used in CANs, especially in CANs, in SNAC, I, I didn't 
stress tested enough, but I was very happy that it scales up to 65,000 CPU cores. So that's, that was quite exciting. Um, but typically because these direct solvers are so fast, yes. most of the production uh, runs at ID, which uh, have a quite decent amount of, uh, of, of, of uh, spatial degrees of freedom, like order of 10 billion, uh, can run on order of an order of magnitude of uh, um, of uh, thousand cores, thousand five thousand cores, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, GPUs maybe we have now a multi-phase code in collaboration with K with with KTH, so they are doing simulations using a, a, a code that's based on CANS with the volume of fluid method, and they use around two hundred GPUs for a, a box with. 2024 to the power three points. So typically I never found really a hard limit that uh, I was really not able to simulate because of uh, a problem of the code. Yeah. Great, thank you. I have one last question for you and uh, this is a very uh, uh, difficult question. Where do you think you will be running your simulation in 25 or 30 years? Uh, do, do you think it's still going to be some sort of CPU, GPUs? So obviously with uh, more power or more uh, cores or less ener more energy efficient, or do you think you will have to redesign completely your, your flow solvers? What do you think on the very long term? Yeah, on the very long term indeed. So uh, yeah, so I think I'm living the moment now so much it's difficult <laughs> to think a bit uh, long term. Uh, but I, I, I feel that, uh, you know, maybe it's, it's, it's going to go more towards, uh, I, would, I would say if, 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 if we think in terms of more memory, more energy efficient, in terms of energy efficiency, I think that the cost will converge more and more to, the, the, the hardware will converge more and more to GPU based. But I'm really not a, a, an expert on that. So, what uh, what I know again, coming back to the to the software part, is that I, I see a lot of progress uh, in terms of compiler developments. There's new comp Fortran compilers based on L LLVM being developed that really target uh, uh, different hardware with the same syntax. Uh, so I'm not too worried about the kind of hardware. I don't really uh, know, but I think and I hope that the code will not change much to run on that hardware. Good. Well, I'm not sure about that, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Maybe uh, only the future me. will uh, only the future will tell us. Yeah. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Pedro, for uh, taking the time uh, to chat um, about your research and about um, high performance computing. It was really nice to see what you are doing, and uh, best of luck for uh, your future uh, research and for your future uh, code development. Yeah, thank you. It was a pleasure. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, for listening to this uh, new episode of the UK Turbulence podcast, uh, the UK podcast Turbulence at the Exascale. Sorry about that. Uh, as usual, I will be posting all the links on, uh, on uh, Twitter, and you will find all the uh, links for the previous podcast on the UK Turbulence Consortium website. So just Google UK Turbulence and uh, you will find us uh, very easily. So thank you very much for listening and hope to see you soon uh, in a new episode.